Remember when MTV used to show music videos? If you're a millennial, you might not. Nowadays, MTV consists mostly of stage reality shows and documentaries which are supposed to highlight social issues such as the T word and controversial programming like white people which was met with so many cries of racism that it apparently forced MTV to release an absolutely mind boggling video in which a smiling, bright eyed, beautiful woman proudly proclaims that it's impossible to be racist against whites. I've got a challenge for you. Try talking about racism with your friends, family, or coworkers, and get ready to watch people squirm. So let's push through the discomfort. Don't worry, you can do it. We're gonna talk about racism. Well, the dictionary defines racism as the hatred or intolerance of another race or races. Well, yes, but racism's a little more complicated than that. The dictionary offers a very simple explanation, because it's just the dictionary. Wait, did she actually just imply that all dictionary definitions are inherently worthless because it's just the dictionary? Okay. But when are we gonna talk about reverse racism? Reverse racism is not a thing. You know what? She's right. Reverse racism isn't a thing. Racism against whites is plain and pure racism, just as any other race can experience. I've been bullied, beaten up, and called all sorts of names in my lifetime, and you're gonna tell me that's not racism. She has the audacity to lecture us on racism while openly mocking victims of racist violence. Whoa, that sounds awful. I'm sorry, none of that stuff is okay. But those are examples of racial prejudice, not racism. That's because racism isn't just about individuals. It's about institutional power. In this place we call reality, Racism and institutional racism are two entirely different concepts with entirely different definitions. The reason we have dictionaries is so that people can't just change definition of words whenever it suits their whims and claim that the new meaning is totally legit. What these people are doing, conflating two entirely different definitions, is nothing short of Orwellian newspeak. That video was so over the top, so in your face, and such blatant propaganda, one might begin to wonder why MTV is pushing this evil message so hard. Enter MTV's public affairs department, which was described in this job description for an internship which was listed at Harvard's Institute of Politics. It reads, The public affairs team at MTV is charged with using the network's superpowers for good. The group develops and manages multi-platform social change initiatives that empower America's youth to have an impact on the biggest challenges facing their generation. The MTV Public Affairs Group works with every department across the network, including programming, digital, social, mobile, MTV News, marketing, sales, press, MTV2, and MTVU. But when we scroll down the page and look at the testimony of former interns, it sheds some light. Let's look at what an intern from 2012 said. My work at MTV was wide-ranging and never dull. A significant portion of my time was spent mining data on issues that young voters are interested in and working with the team to reframe this data in ways easily digestible for MTV's viewership. This required some creative uses of the Jersey Shore cast at times. It continues, As a brand that worships at the altar of its viewers, the heads of our department always look to me for feedback on the Power of 12 campaign. This ranged from asking for my thoughts on how to best incorporate a partner like CNN or BuzzFeed, or even how best to pitch our campaign to the Romney and Obama camps. Ah, talk about researchers listening to young voters and attempts to partner with both Romney and Obama. Well, it seems like back in 2012, MTV Public Affairs sounded like a rather nonpartisan affair. But when we look at an intern's description of working in the same department there the summer of 2014, two years later, we noticed that the nonpartisan appearance was dropped completely, and the only focus is purely on progressive programming. It reads, The public affairs department is always busy. There was no making copies or fetching coffee. Instead, I was given the opportunity to meaningfully contribute to MTV's social campaigns, specifically the Look Different campaign, which focuses on revealing the hidden racial, gender, and anti-LGBT biases that millennials experience and witness every day. 
It continues, Generally, my everyday work was grounded in research and assignments covered relevant topics ranging from gun violence to LGBT rights to gender roles to the effects of racial slurs and much, much more. Additionally, social media was essential to my work and it was so rewarding to track how the public was embracing the campaign via Twitter, Tumblr, and Facebook. In December of 2014, the fig leaf of impartiality at MTV Public Affairs was dropped completely. An article from The Wrap, a Hollywood news site, is titled, MTV taps former White House staffer as new head of public affairs. It reads, MTV named Ronnie Cho as the network's new vice president of public affairs. Cho previously served as the associate director of the White House Office of Public Engagement, working as the chief liaison to young Americans. Cho, who will be based in New York, will now oversee the strategic direction of all pro-social campaigns across MTV, MTV2, and MTVU's television, digital, and social properties. He will report to MTV and Logo TV president Stephen Friedman. Ronnie has dedicated himself to being an advocate for young people, said Friedman in a statement. He's the perfect person to expand MTV's role as the megaphone for the millennial generation and to provide our audience new tools to take action on the issues they care about most. The Emmy-winning HBO documentary, By the People, The Election of Barack Obama, featured Cho prominently during then-Senator Obama's rise to prominence in his successful 2008 presidential campaign. Prior to joining the White House, he was an editor at the Newsweek Daily Beast Company in New York, where he wrote and edited content related to social justice, innovation, and social entrepreneurship. Okay, now let's take a look at the White House's listing of Ronnie Cho to glean some insight. It reads, The Phoenix, Arizona native has worked on several political and issue campaigns, including Senator John Kerry's 2004 presidential election, former Arizona Governor Janet Napolitano's 2006 gubernatorial race, and most recently on the Obama for America campaign beginning in Iowa of 2007. It is apparent that Mr. Cho has been incredibly loyal to and active in the Democratic Party. After involvement in multiple high-profile campaigns, he took a breather to write for the Daily Beast before getting picked up by Obama to work in what is considered by some to be the Ministry of Youth Propaganda. Now, he's the man in charge of all of MTV's pro-social campaigns, which are specifically meant to engage the youth and offer them new tools to cultivate change. Knowing this, it raises the question, is MTV now under direct control of the Democratic Party for use as a propaganda machine? If so, it wouldn't be surprising. In 2006, a presentation was given to Microsoft Research by two of the founders of Vox Media, who managed sites such as The Daily Coast, SB Nation, The Verge, Polygon, Curbed, Eater, Racked, Vox, and Recode. And so we stepped into that vacuum and quickly found that there was a lot of people out all across the nation that were interested in hearing an authentic voice, but not only that, but they were interested in participating by commenting and commenting not only with us but the other people on the blogs in this new way of political dialogue. And from there it's grown to where we were involved with the Howard Dean campaign and um, the blogs have grown tenfold since then to where now Marcos blog, Daily Coast, gets over half a million visitors a day. So we wrote this book coming out of the 2004 election um, with the Democrats having lost, and from our opinion, George Bush was one of the worst presidents ever in his first term. and. We felt that John Kerry had all the things on his side. The, the polls showed the issue-wise that the people agreed with where the Democratic Party were on the issues. They, they, they agreed that the, the uh, nation was going in the wrong direction, but the Democratic Party lost nonetheless. And so we set out to travel all around the country. We went to 20 different states, interviewed 160 p people. And what we started out originally with as an idea was that the Democratic Party lacked a brand. but. We quickly went much deeper than that, and what we really found out was there were structural problems with how the Democratic Party was operating at the campaign and election level in terms of organizing. And those are the things that we wrote about the book. And, and our voices, given the, the amount that the um, audience has increased, has allowed us to sort of become gay crashers into the system that is ossified within the Democratic Party and, and hopefully bring about a change there. And so 
you know, for us, it's kind of, in a lot of ways, it's frustrating to see that they have embraced their innovators and their entrepreneurs, and we have to actually beat them over the head uh, with whether it's blogging or whether it's just book, we have to beat them over the head for them to realize that they need to start changing the way they're doing business and adopt, adapt to the changing political and media and technological landscape. And they didn't want to change. We both worked on Howard Dean's campaign and um, after the election, um, sort of our, our initial impulse was to bring about change inside the structure of the Democratic Party or as an organization. So we're both at the forefront of pushing for Howard Dean's movement into the DNC. And, and it's hard to break through that. But I think with technology, we can do that. And that's what we wound up doing with Howard Dean with that chair election is we broadcasted all over the blogs that you know we were going to make a statement. And there were people in D.C. that said, over my dead body, would Howard Dean be chairman of the uh, DNC? But we organized nationally. They had, the DNC had regional meetings in all four of the regions of the U.S. Um, leading up to that election, and, and we had hundreds of people show up at these meetings where nobody ever showed up before. And we basically made a statement that, look, if you guys you know, you don't go along with this, then you know, we're on the outside. We'll break in by ousting you out of the party itself at the very precinct level. And so there's been participation within the Democratic Party in terms of opening some of that up. But obviously, Howard Dean was just one step in. There's a lot more work to be done. Yeah, and, you know, Howard Dean's at the top, so we have to break through the, the state parties and, the, and down to the county level. And, you know, like Jerome says, you can't find information on how to take over your local party because it's on purpose. They don't want challengers. And they'd rather lose and carry their fancy little title because it makes them feel like big shit rather than actually have to work and do their jobs, which is to actually generate, create more Democrats and, and start winning some elections. Well, it looks like they've done a great job at creating Democratic voters by inventing the progressive brand and accompanying fabrications such as the war on women in tech, which, by the way, was proven to be a lie in a video on this channel by an award-winning research team at the University of Washington. Also, when Jeremy Armstrong talked about threatening to oust all Democrats out of the Democratic Party at the precinct level if they didn't capitulate, it almost sounded like they were claiming to have held a successful coup of the Democratic Party. In summary, many of these media outlets which consistently pump out progressive propaganda are conspicuously tied to the Democratic Party. Lefties love to claim that progressive media bias is a myth, but when so many major media outlets have these sorts of deep and powerful ties to the Democratic Party, we can see that they are either bold-faced lying or incredibly uninformed.